We're going to be opening up the Gospel of John today, turning through to John chapter 11. Pastor Peter is going to be opening up uh, John chapter 11. We'll read from verse 1 through to 44, and then I'll pray, and then we'll invite Peter to come forward. So that was John chapter 11, picking up at verse 1. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister, Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, hear him you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, The Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary arise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit 
and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And as we come to hear it, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are pleased to speak today. That, Lord, when your word is read and when your word is preached, we hear the voice of Jesus Christ again. And so we pray this day, Lord, that as Paul says to the Galatians, that we would see Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified in our midst today. That we, by faith, as we hear Uh, The words of your servant, Pastor Peter, we would hear the words of Christ, we would see him, we would love him, and Lord, we would find great joy in him. Would you glorify your son through the preaching of the word of God? Would you help Pastor Peter that, Lord, our hearts might burn within us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Peter. Well, good morning. (coughs) Margaret and I are delighted to be back with you again and, and among so many people that we have known so well and have loved so dearly. So thank you for your smiling faces. They were a great comfort. Uh, Margaret and I have uh, 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 moved in with our daughter and son-in-law and their and our two grandchildren and living with them. And uh, <clears throat> I'm still teaching at Grace College, which is just to the left of the car park, in case you haven't found your way there yet. And Margaret and I continue to have a counselling and conciliation ministry uh, for uh, people, and we enjoy doing that together, and uh, the Lord has uh, been pleased to bless that in many ways. Well, this morning we're in John chapter 11, and I've given the uh, sermon this morning a title. And the title is Living the Impossible Life. Living the Impossible Life. Now, I've chosen this title because of the impossibility of having faith in a God who does not show up on time. What's the point of believing if God does not come through for you? When Jesus, where is Jesus when you need him the most? Why doesn't he show up on time? Why is it that God seems so slow to answer our cries? 
At times, this life of faith seems impossible. It's too much. It's too hard. Doesn't it seem too much that God asks us to put him first, to trust him, to forsake all others, to live with his timetable? And so it was with Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha were called on to live the impossible life of faith in their darkest hour. Now John only records eight miracles in his gospel. Water into wine, two healing miracles, feeding the 5,000, walking on the water, the man born blind, this one, the raising of Lazarus, and a post-resurrection miracle of the fish catch. And in these eight miracles, we see Jesus facing sickness in order to bring healing, facing hunger in order to bring fullness, facing storm in order to bring calm, facing blindness in order to bring sight, and facing death in order to bring life. Now John himself leaves us in no doubt as to why he has chosen these miracles to record in his gospel. In chapter 20, verse 30, this is what he says. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written, these eight miracles are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. His purpose in recording these miracles was to confront readers and us with their unbelief. You see that in our passage, uh, John 11, verse 14. And he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. And in verse 42, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. The purpose of the miracle was to confront people with their unbelief. And some did believe. You see that in verse 45? Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. Some did believe. But others responded by taking steps to put him to death. See that in verse 53. From that day on, they plotted to take his life. And just think for a moment how ridiculous that is. Here is one who was raised from the dead, a man who's been dead four days. And the people watching on, some of them say, this is not good, we must put this man to death. (laughs) How can you put to death someone who has the power over death? How ridiculous. Plotting to put to death one who has just raised the dead. Seeking to kill the one who has the power of life over death. This, my friends, is the foolishness of unbelief. And right here in this passage, the foolishness of unbelief is being contrasted with an invitation to live the impossible life. And to turn away from that invitation is to turn back to the foolishness of your unbelief. Out of the 45 verses that Logan read in this account, Only two verses right at the very end are given over to the miracle itself. Seems a bit of a waste of rice paper and black ink, doesn't it? Why did the Holy Spirit take so long to get to the point? Like a good sermon. Two verses are given over to the miracle. The rest of the passage is an invitation to live the impossible life, to live a life based on faith when all around you are both the attractions and disappointments of this life. 
That's why the invitation to Martha to believe came before the miracle. The invitation comes before because she is to walk by faith and not by sight. She has been called on to believe the impossible with her brother right there, four days dead. So how are you doing? How are you doing living the impossible life? Well, that was my introduction. Now let's look a bit more closely at the passage. After the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9, the opposition toward Jesus mounted in earnest. You see that in chapter 10, verse 31. And the Jews picked up stones to stone him. How dare you heal a man born blind? We're going to stone you for it. See the foolishness of unbelief? So, in, in, in the light of this mounting opposition against him, Jesus retreated across the Jordan River into the Transjordan to relative safety so as to continue his ministry. See in verse uh, chapter 10, verse 39. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days, and here he stayed, and many people came to him. And they said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that Jesus said about this man was true, and in that place many believed in Jesus. So he went to a place of relative security and safety to continue his ministry of gospel preaching. And it was from that place of relative safety that he was summoned to appear at Bethany on account of Lazarus's sickness. And it was a deadly request that the sisters made of Jesus. A deadly request to return to Judea within the shadow of Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets. Verse 8 his disciples tried to dissuade him. Chapter 11, verse 8. But Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? <laughs> when Jesus wasn't to be dissuaded, Thomas said in verse 16, let us also go that we may die with him. There was no doubt in the minds of the disciples the seriousness of the situation if Jesus was to return to Bethany, three k's from Jerusalem. It was a request to face death. But whose death was he going back to face? Lazarus's death or his own death? Here we see the good shepherd willing to risk his own life for the sheep. Chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and he was prepared to do that. He was prepared to do that for Lazarus, for Martha and for Mary. And the murderous rage that this miracle would incite would cause Jesus to retreat again. Verse 54 of chapter 11. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert to a village called Ephraim where he stayed with his disciples. And there he would await the Passover and his final entry into Jerusalem in chapter 12. So this miracle, this miracle of, of raising Lazarus <clears throat> would begin a chain of events that would lead to Christ's own death and to his own resurrection, the greatest of all miracles in John's gospel. Hence, you see, there was a glory in this miracle, a glory that would point beyond the raising of Lazarus to a greater glory, to a greater resurrection, to the glory of God's Son, Jesus himself. You see that in verse 4? When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And in verse 40, Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
You see, when you live the impossible life, when you live the impossible life, you see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. In the midst of all the woes and the weeping of this life, you will see with the eyes of faith the glory of God near at hand. Since the one who has conquered even death has promised never to leave us or forsake us. For Jesus, death is never final. So he went back to Bethany. And that brings us to Jesus' dialogue with Martha. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again on the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. Now this conversation which takes place right in the middle of the account serves to pivot the whole account around 180 degrees. This conversation with Martha shifts the focus of the passage off the impending miracle and on to the miracle worker himself, the one who raises the dead, the one who himself will rise from the dead after three days. This is why Jesus has delayed his response to the sister's request. It was to call them to an impossible life of faith when all around them was falling apart. See, this was Martha's struggle. Martha's struggle was to see that there's more going on here than what she longs for or what she even weeps for. Jesus' tears and grief was because of her tears and grief. And in her grief and loss, Jesus is tenderly asking her to dare to believe that beyond the comforting presence of Jesus himself was a life-giving power that not only Lazarus, but Martha herself should be caught up in. She is being asked here to believe in something much more than simply Jesus' power to heal or even raise her brother from the dead, something more glorious, something more impossible. Could the resurrection miracle be for Martha as well? Could this miracle be for Martha's sake <laughs> and not just for Lazarus's? Is this miracle something that Martha herself has to enter into in faith believing that just as Lazarus's tomb was, became empty, so her tomb would also. That's why, you see, her time of grief after four days is exactly the right time for Jesus to come and urge her to reach out in faith and grasp that greater glory when all else seems lost. Verse 6, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. When you read that, doesn't it, want you to, doesn't it make you want to scream in frustration? Doesn't it make you want to set your hair on fire? You've just been told that Jesus loved Lazarus. And as soon as he heard that he was sick, Jesus' decision was, hmm, Let's wait a couple of days. Let's not be in a hurry to go and heal this man. Let's wait a couple of days. You see, it's the impossible life, isn't it? And, and so you're tempted to think, well, well, doesn't he really love these people? That he's not answering their cry immediately and immediately giving them relief to the very thing that they're so anxious about, that they're grieving about, if he really loved them, wouldn't he be there immediately to bring his healing power, to bring his comforting presence? 
wouldn't he? He's supposed to nod and say, yes. <laughs> if he really loved them, he would. But you know what? Because he really loved them, he waited two more days. Because he loved them. He wanted them to believe in something far more greater than simply his power to heal. They believed that Jesus was a healer of sick people. They did not believe he was a raiser of dead people. And because he loved them, because he loved them, he wanted them to put their faith in him as a raiser of dead people, not simply as a healer of sick people. Because he loved them. So, when he doesn't answer your cries the moment you, you utter them, and it seems like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, where is Jesus when you need him the most? He's weeping, he's grieving, and he's waiting because he loves you. He has something greater in mind for you than simply the alleviation of your current distress. He has a greater glory in mind for you that he wants you to see and put your faith in this impossible life. So he waited, not to make the miracle more spectacular, but to invite them to be part of a greater glory, to proclaim to Mary and Martha and to the world his glory that will be seen in his resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Here is the greater glory, centered in the person of Jesus and his promise of resurrection. That's why he waited to be sure that Lazarus was known to be dead. That's why he waited till there is no doubt, no doubt in the minds of everybody that Lazarus was dead. You see, twice in this passage we are told that Lazarus had been dead four days. Verse 17 and verse 39. Jesus waited until there were very dead bones. Jesus waited until there were very dead bones. What's the greatest chapter on resurrection in the Old Testament? I know you're going to tell me. Ezekiel 37. I'm going to read to you the first six verses of Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley that was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And you will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel was asked the same question that Martha was asked. Do you believe in the God of resurrection? Ezekiel too was called on to, hear, to live the impossible life. Dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Lazarus, come out. Did you get that? I'll say it again. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Lazarus, come out. Jesus gave a loud shout to those dead bones. And Lazarus heard the word of the Lord, and he came out. 
verse 43. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus came out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen and the cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off his grave clothes and let him go. Now imagine if you were there in that crowd and you had kind of pushed your way forward as close to Jesus as you could get and as close to the mouth of the tomb as you could get because you suspected that something spectacular was about to happen and then suddenly <laughs> this, this figure appears walking out, you know, all, you know wrapped up and, and Jesus turns to you and says, take those clothes off him. Take those bandages off him. And you're going, well, <laughs> well what about this bloke? He could do it better than me. <laughs> what are you going to see? What's waiting for you behind those bandages? Don't you just love the drama? And the dead man came out. Well, Jesus gave a loud shout. You ever wondered why the shout was loud? Well, it wasn't loud so Lazarus would hear it. Because <laughs> Lazarus was dead, four days dead. See? Well, Jesus tells us, doesn't he? He gave a loud shout for the benefit of those standing around that they might believe. It was the shout of Ezekiel's vision. It was the shout of Christ's triumph and victory over death. It was the shout to awaken the dead. It was a shout that anticipated the last day's resurrection. For in John chapter 5, we have these amazing words. John chapter 5, verse 25. Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Verse 28 of John 5. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. That's the reason why Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. See, if Jesus had just said, come out, every grave within earshot would have opened up based on John chapter 5. There would have been alive people walking up around from the dead all over the place. But Jesus said, no, 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 Lazarus. Just Lazarus this time, the rest of you wait. This is just for Lazarus. This call is just for him. Lazarus, you come out. That's all that needs to happen right now as Lazarus is for you to come out so that they might see and that they might believe. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? A personal call just for Lazarus. The man who needed to be given New life. Lazarus, come out. Well, you can see where the sermon is going, can't you? That same call comes to us today in the gospel. That same call comes today after us today in the gospel as Jesus calls each of us by name. It's a call to step from darkness into light. It's a call to step from death to life. It's a call to trust Christ in an impossible situation. It's a call to forsake all others and cling first to him. A call to say yes to Christ when all around you others are saying no to him. A call to live the impossible life of faith. That same call to live the impossible life came to Abraham. And what was his response? Well, we're told in Romans chapter 4 that he did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And what was God's promise to Abraham? It was the promise of resurrection. And that ancient promise that was given to Abraham and Ezekiel 
and to Lazarus, Mary and Martha is the same promise that has come down to us today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. One Thessalonians chapter four verse fifteen. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. What is that loud command? What is that loud command? Well, we know now, don't we, what that loud command will be on that day. It's the same command that God gave Ezekiel. It's the same command that God <clears throat> gave Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. And on the day of Christ's return, we will see the, reader, uh, the rider on the white horse. We will hear the trumpets, and we will see the angels, and we will hear again the word of the Lord, that loud command. Peter, come out. Susan, come out. Henry, come out. Margaret, come out. And the dead in Christ will rise first as God calls each of them by name to come out from where their bodies have been laid. This is where you shout, jump to your feet and shout, Hallelujah. <laughs> The dead in Christ will rise first to a greater glory than they could ever have imagined. But here's the thing, my friend. If you would hear him shout your name on that day, then you must respond to him when he calls you by name on this day. If you would hear him call your name on that day, then you must respond to him when he calls you by name on this day. Call of the gospel. If you have heard Jesus call you by name, and if you have responded by faith the way Martha did, then you will hear his shout again when he calls you by name on that last day to come forth from the grave in which your body has been laid, to join a vast multitude standing before the throne, no longer dressed in grave clothes but part of a greater glory. Well, let's finish up with a word of application here this morning. Before that day comes, are you willing to live the impossible life? Do not be bound any longer by the grave clothes of doubt and unbelief. They smell of this present evil age. Rather, let the shout of the gospel call this morning set you free to live a resurrected life. In the face of the death and decay of this present evil age that is passing away. He is never late. He times it perfectly to reach our hearts in the moment of darkest night with the promise of a greater glory. His call is to live new resurrected lives as we await that day. Lives that by faith hope in the midst of despair, love in the midst of hate, give in the midst of grasping, risk in the midst of fear, pray in the midst of doubt, believe in the midst of unbelief, forgive in the midst of pain, are holy in the midst of decadence, go on when all else is failing, to live as Christ when so few do, to live the impossible life. And how are we to respond when he calls out our name today? When we hear the gospel call of new life promised, how are we to respond? 
So I'd like to leave you with three words this morning. Sorry, thank you, please. Thank you is really just one word. Three words. Sorry, thank you, please. This is how we respond today to the gospel call when the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and urges us to put our faith in him and live the impossible life. We respond with a sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry for the way that I've lived my life without regard to you and the wicked things I've done. Thank you. Thank you that you died for me and took my place and my punishment that I might be forgiven of my sins. Please, please forgive my sins and give me your Holy Spirit so that I might live a completely new life. Sorry, thank you, please. So you put them on, the, uh, on a fridge magnet on your fridge door. Sorry, thank you, please. And every morning when you go to the fridge to get the milk for your wheat box, you read that. Sorry, thank you, please. And it reminds you that today, you need to begin today and every day responding to God's gospel call in your life that today, by faith, you are going to live the impossible life for him. Did I not tell you? That if you believed, you would see the glory of God's Son, both now and on that last day of resurrection triumph. So, what better time than when we celebrate the Lord's Supper to again confess our sins and to ask God's forgiveness right here in this building this morning and his help to embrace again the impossible life of faith and the promise of resurrection to a greater glory. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that the things that are most important for us to know are most clear in Scripture. And Father, at times like this, we are overwhelmed with the extent of your grace. Your grace is too much. It's too much for our poor hearts to be able to handle and to embrace. The grace, Father, that goes beyond this life to an everlasting life, a resurrection life. And Father, we ask that this morning your Holy Spirit would, would, would release in our hearts those things that are holding us back from responding to you with, sorry, thank you, please that there might not be one person, Father, who walks from this building this morning who has not put their lives into your hands and asked you to forgive their sins with the promise of a greater glory to come. We ask these things that the glory of God's Son might be seen among us for his name's sake. Amen.